mansion was one of the most incredible mansions we've ever explored. It sits 30 minutes. It closed down in 2000. Number 10, Café du Monde. Café du Monde is probably one of the most well-known places on this list, mostly for having what many people say are the best beignets in town. But there can be a problem with the service. No, not from the employees, I'm sure that they're amazing, but apparently some people give their order to a waiter only to never have it arrive or see the waiter again. Since the restaurant is open 24 hours a day, some customers have seen some freaky things at night, including a ghost waiter who has been haunting the place for decades. No one knows who they might have been, but they must have loved their job a whole lot if they keep coming back to work after they've passed on. Or maybe they worked themselves to death and can't escape the horrors of the night shift. As someone with a lot of restaurant experience, I feel bad for not only the ghostly server, but for the folks who never got their orders. Number nine, the old French opera house. Uh, before we move on to number nine, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons so that I can keep bringing you the most amazing videos. While it no longer stands Stands today and many bars and businesses take up the space where it once was, the witch of the opera house still lurks in the area of her final resting place. Her story begins in the 1860s. Her name was Marguerite and she made quite a splash during her debut, but not because she was a good singer, apparently she wasn't, but it was because of her beauty. After a while, people began to see through her and they realized that beauty wasn't enough to carry a show and her career dried up. Financially ruined after losing her career and husband due to a sudden accident, Marguerite decided to fall back and open a bakery. But there was a problem. She couldn't bake. So she sent for the best Parisian pastry chef that she could find, and he came to work for her and he was pretty easy on the eyes. They fell for each other and they were happy for years. Then one day she heard that her new husband was cheating on her and had a second apartment that they used as a love nest. Enraged, she went to the apartment in the middle of the night, turned on the gas in the fireplace and left with the gas leaking out. The chef and the mistress suffocated and Marguerite broke into the opera house and hung herself from the chandelier in her old costume which she'd stolen from the production. They say that you can still hear her and see her screaming for her lost love in the street where the opera house once stood. Number eight, the old absinthe house. It was originally built in 1752, but burned down in the Great Friday Fire of 1788. When it was rebuilt, it became a place for people to meet and discuss less than savory topics and have some absinthe, a very strong alcohol that was said to have hallucinogenic properties. While many people gathered for drinks here, there was one meeting that took place that was instrumental in American history. According to the legend, in 1815, General Andrew Jackson called for a meeting with someone you wouldn't expect, a notorious pirate by the name of Jean Lafitte. Now, why was a general meeting with a pirate? Well, he needed help with the impending battle with the British for the city, and he knew that Jean knew the city and its surrounding swamps and waters like the back of his hand. In exchange for full pardons, Jackson had Jean's army of pirates released from jail so that they could assist with the war, and they actually helped him turn the tide of what became known as the Battle for New Orleans. Lafitte can still be seen at his favorite spot in the bar on the second floor, wearing his hat and and indulging himself with food and drink. Others have spotted the ghosts of Andrew Jackson, as well as Marie Laveau and Madame Lalaurie, both of whom we'll talk about in a little while. With all of these spirits around and reports of slamming doors, footsteps, and flying bottles, I'd stay away from here. Next up at number seven, the old Bryce Hospital. There are few places in this world more haunted than an old abandoned mental health facility. And there is no denying that the torment that went on here is a huge reason as to why so many spirits Spirits remain haunting its grounds, seeking revenge. Built during the segregation era of America, the building was branded as an insane asylum for those suffering from mental illnesses, when in reality, it was pretty much a work camp for able-bodied black people who were admitted under false pretenses and then forced into slave labor, working in the fields around the hospital. Shockingly, the facility remained open until 1977 and only closed due to new desegregation laws. It comes as no surprise that after years years of abuse and inhumane living conditions suffered by the so-called patients that people claim to have had strange experiences while visiting. Those who've dared to visit the abandoned hospital claim the souls are angry and that as soon as you walk in, you can feel the air shift. Many report hearing strange noises and some even claim to have seen shadowy figures lurking around every corner. Next up at number six is St. James Hotel. For whatever reason, hotels tend to be a pretty big hotspot for paranormal 
paranormal encounters. And the St. James Hotel is definitely a part of that phenomenon. Back in the day it was built, it was the first hotel operated by a black congressman. And despite having many years of success, it hit hard times in the late 1800s and was eventually forced to close its doors to the public. Fast forward about 100 years to 1997 and the hotel reopened. But this time something was off about the building, something just wasn't right. During its century long time as an abandoned building, it became a horrifying hub for lost souls and I guess they decided to remain haunting all those that dare stay the night. Visitors claim seeing full bodied apparitions sitting at the bar or witness lights shutting off out of nowhere. But most creepy of all was a recorded visit when a psychic research team was brought in and they walked the grounds asking if anyone was there, but they never heard a response. Back. But later on, when they played the tapes, an older man's voice responded saying, Well, that's a stupid question, making everyone in the room jump. So, what do you say? Are you brave enough to pay the ghosts a visit? Coming in at number 5, Cahaba Ghost Town. It likely comes as no surprise that a ghost town is also home to thousands of unsettling spirits. But few are more terrifying than Cahaba. Once the capital city of Alabama, it was abandoned after the Civil War when terrible flooding led to most of the buildings falling into complete disrepair and so the citizens who survived were forced to leave for good. Today, nothing remains but the ruins of what used to be, including a church, a few cemeteries, and the Barker Mansion and its slave quarters. And I mean, that is just all the ingredients for a haunted ghost town if I've ever heard of one. Those that have tried to visit the once booming city recount that as soon as you enter the town's borders, cell service gets spotty and unreliable, only to be completely fine as soon as you step even one foot off the border of the town. While that alone might not scare visitors away, there are also countless reports reports of visitors witnessing terrifying apparitions and hearing the voices of the dead crying out at night for revenge. So visit at your own risk, but don't say I didn't warn you. Coming in at number 4 is the Boynton Oak. Of all the things that are usually haunted, like cemeteries, hospitals, churches, the last thing you'd likely expect to need to be afraid of was a tree. But trust me, this is no ordinary tree. The Boynton Oak is said to have grown from the grave of one Mr. Charles Boynton. As the legend goes, back in 1835, Charles was accused of friend Nathaniel Frost. Charles disputed the accusation and never once wavered from his alleged innocence. Still, he was found guilty for the crime and sentenced to execution as payback. But right before he was executed, he declared in front of everyone that a tree would spring forth from his grave as a proof of his innocence, and then they would all see that they had caught the wrong man. And shockingly, this is exactly what happened. Many claim that Charles's spirit haunts the tree above his grave, often freaking out those who come to visit. Even spookier is that some claim to have even seen him sitting under the tree waiting. But just who is he waiting for? No one knows exactly. Coming in at number 3 is Sloss Furnaces. Once built as a means to access iron ore, coal and limestone, the Sloss Furnaces were far from a safe place to work. It's believed over the years at least 47 men lost their lives working at the furnaces due to the incredibly dangerous work conditions. But the most talked about is that of James Slag Wormwood, a former foreman of the furnaces known for being cruel to his employees and who died after slipping and falling into a pool of molten iron ore. Although there is rumor he may have been pushed by his workers forced to the brink after his unending abuse. Still, after Wormwood's death, strange things started happening more and more frequently. Workers were seeing strange things, hearing strange noises, and started to feel like they were going crazy. Employees were being found injured or seen tripping and falling out of nowhere. Each of them recounted that an angry man covered in burns had tried to push them after screaming at them to get back to work. Then in 1971, a watchman encountered what he described as a half man, half demon who tried to push him up the stairs. After the watchman refused the spirit's advance, he was badly beaten by the entity until he fell unconscious. Later while being examined, he was found to be covered in severe burns where he says he was beaten. So unless you're looking to be beaten up by an angry spirit and covered in burns from the blows. 
I might suggest a different place for your visit. Coming in at number two is Bear Creek Swamp. Even at the best of times, swamps give off spooky and creepy vibes, and this one might just be the worst of them all. Legend has it that many years ago, a woman's son went missing. Scared, the mother went looking for him in the nearby swamp, hoping that he had simply run away from home. But no matter how long she looked, she could never find him. It said she died in the swamp looking for him, and if you walk into the swamp today and say, we have your baby three times, she will come out of nowhere and attack you until you leave for good. And don't even try to come back after she's banished you. You might not be so lucky the second time around. And last up today in our number one spot is Sweetwater Mansion. Designed by war vet General John Brahan, this mansion was named after the nearby creek and first occupied by the general's son-in-law, Robert Patton. Under Patton's jurisdiction, the basement of the mansion served as a civil war hospital and a county jail. And if that wasn't enough, it's said that at one point someone who lived in the mansion practiced dark magic, which thinned the veil between worlds. This would make sense considering just how many people have witnessed earth shattering apparitions that sent them running for the hills. Most notably is the casket that contains a body of a confederate soldier in one of the downstairs rooms that will suddenly disappear right in front of your eyes. It's believed that the casket is haunted by the spirit of original owner Robert Patton, whose funeral was held at the home and who was documented having an open casket ceremony. But that's not even the scariest part. There's a room on the property that routinely locks female visitors inside. In fact, it happens so frequently that caretakers of the property have avoided entering it at all costs. And if a self-locking door and a terrifying soldier ghost don't turn you off of the property, there is also a secret room on the property with no door. The only way to enter is by a small window and it's believed that anyone who goes in will never escape. So if I were you, Number 10, Malabar Farm. Malabar Farm was built in 1939 by Pulitzer Prize winning author Louis Bromfield and was his home until his death in 1956. But before it was built, another family lived there in the 19th century. Celie Rose, a challenged young woman who lived there with her family, developed a romantic fixation on a neighborhood boy. When Celie's family told her to stop claiming the boy as her fiance, she mixed rat poison in their porridge. Her father and brother died, but her mother survived. At her trial, Celie couldn't understand why her parents didn't come to see her. After all, she said, the rats always came back after her daddy fed them rat poison in the barn. Afterwards, she went on and lived with her mother, whom, yes, she tried to kill, but then Celie poisoned her again, and this time it worked. At age 23, Celie stood trial truly alone, but was found not guilty by reason of insanity and sent to a state hospital. She lived out the rest of her life in an insane asylum and since then the house has been haunted. When visitors saw a woman dressed like Celie Rose outside the house, people have seen lights flicker, felt a phantom cat, disembodied voices are heard, and there's an overall eerie feeling on the property. Yeah. No kidding. Number 9. Beaver Creek State Park Although this park is beautiful during the day, it has a darker side at night. A portion of the park was once part of a canal system from the early 1800s. There are two locks that are said to be haunted. Jake's Lock is said to be named after a former canal worker who was struck by lightning while walking across the top of the lock. He died instantly, but some claim that on certain nights, especially stormy ones, Jake returns with his ghostly lantern to continue his evening's work. Spooky. Nearby, Gretchen's Lock is said to be haunted by the ghost of a canal worker's daughter. Legend has it her father put her coffin inside the lock until he could load her body onto a ship headed for their homeland. But when the coffin was loaded onto a ship bound for home, the ship was lost at sea and didn't make it. Gretchen, pleading to rejoin her mother, reportedly makes an appearance at the lock every year on the anniversary of her death, which is just very sad. Number 8. The Wandle House. The Wandle House was constructed in 1916 by the Wheeling and Lake Erie Railway with funds contributed by railroaders. The Brewster Railroad YMCA featured 62 dormitory rooms used by the railroad workers, a restaurant, movie theater, and bowling alley. Today, the building is home to the Historical Society and houses memorabilia from baseball team photos, class pictures from Beach City and Brewster schools, railroad memorabilia and equipment, payroll records, and military uniforms. It's filled with with tons of history, so those
heroes from the past like to visit. While there, you might come across Teresa, who worked in the eatery around the 1940s and 50s. People have also reported hearing noises, seeing doorknobs turning on their own, and dark figures. And even one time, someone who was doing work in the basement of the building watched a person walk through a wall. Let me just say, I've seen a ghost walk through a wall before too, and it's creepy, so it's not something I'd like to see again. In our number 7 spot, we have the Faulkner House. William Faulkner was a Nobel Prize winning author who wrote many amazing works, including The Sound and the Fury and As I Lay Dying. Faulkner moved to this house on Pirate's Alley in the 1920s, and it's actually where he wrote his first novel, A Soldier's Pay. The house was bought by a couple in 1990 and turned into a bookstore, but apparently Faulkner never left. Visitors report the smell of pipe smoke, which the author was smoking constantly while the new owners were not, as well as books falling off the shelves, usually books written by him. I feel like buying a haunted book is just a recipe for trouble, even if it's a classic. Number 6. Le Petit Theatre Established in 1916, this theatre has been the host to many plays and performers over the years, but one has become more infamous than the rest. In 1930s, many plays were coming through, touring the south, and one of them was led by a performer called Caroline. Her last name has been lost to time. Right before a performance, she decided to go for a walk outside on the theatre's balcony and tragically fell over the and lost her life. Now, visitors of the theater who go stand in the spot she fell from report a sudden drop in temperature and feel a pull towards the edge. Some people also say that they've seen Caroline's reflection in the water of the theater's fountain, still in costume, ready to go on stage. What is it with Nola and haunted theaters? <laughs> Number 5. Sultan's Palace In 1839, Jean-Baptiste Le Pret purchased a lavish half-story mansion from a struggling dentist as a new home for his brother, who just so happened to be a Sultan from a far off land. When the Sultan arrived by ship, he brought with him a harem of wives, eunuchs, and all sorts of lavish furniture, all of which paraded through the street on their way to the house. Townspeople who lived nearby heard all night parties and the smell of smoke emanating from within the palace and were put off that they were never invited. But one day a man was walking by and he saw something shocking, blood dripping down the front steps and forming a pool in the street. The man fled to a police station to tell them about what he'd found and when the police arrived they saw quite a grisly scene. Bodies were lying all over the floor, some with missing limbs, some cut open and broken as though some sort of beast had torn them apart. But the most disturbing find was in the courtyard, where through the wet soil a hand was reaching up but not moving as if whoever belonged to it was asking for help after being buried alive. When they dug him up, they recognized him as the Sultan himself. The case was never solved, but it was believed to be the brother's doing that caused the horrors, as his body was never found, and he had the most to gain from the Sultan's death. Number 4. Pharmacy Museum Now, I know a pharmacy museum doesn't sound that exciting, but stay with me here. In 1823, Louis de Philo, the nation's first licensed pharmacist, opened a pharmacy where the museum now stands and ran it successfully for years, but in 1855 he sold it to Dr. Joseph Dupa, who lived there until he died of syphilis in 1867, but it seems that he got what he deserved. Dr. Dupa allegedly was performing shocking experiments on pregnant slaves, as well as other horrible things like poisoning with what he told people was medicine. It is said that his spirit is doomed to haunt the museum where some of the remnants of his grotesque experiments still remain, and visitors have reported seeing him in a brown suit, throwing books and even pushing people to the ground. He seems like a vengeful spirit, so stay away from here. Number 3. Marie Laveau's House Marie Laveau is perhaps one of the most well-known and allegedly most powerful voodoo practitioners of all time. Born in 1794, she was the student and successor of Dr. John, a voodoo priest who was supposedly an African prince from Senegal. She would often conduct business in Congo Square, earning the favor of slaves by giving them charms, cures, and even spells in return for information on their masters. She used this information when the masters requested her services to impress them in a simpler way before showing her true power and conducting rituals. The house where she lived was also said to be a meeting place for people People where they performed chants and rituals late into the night. The house was torn down in 1903, but a new structure, which is now a vacation rental, was built on the same foundations, and some say that that's how her spirit still remains in the house. One couple recounted the story of their stay, where late one night they heard 
chanting and drumming. They checked outside, but there was no one there. When they realized the sounds were coming from the empty living room, they decided to not sleep there that night. Good call. When they returned the next morning, there was a single pristine feather lying in the middle of the living room, but all of the doors and the windows were locked tight. They checked out immediately and never returned. Because to a voodoo practitioner, a feather is good luck. But to an unsuspecting person, it is an omen of death or a hex having been placed upon you. So stay away from here if you don't wish to be cursed. Number two, St. Louis Cemetery number one. Established in 1789, this cemetery is New Orleans' oldest extant gravesite and is also considered one of the most haunted cemeteries in the US. With over 700 tombs and over 100,000 dead buried here, it makes sense that there would be some spirits that hung around. While most ghosts are said to haunt the places that they died, and not their graves, something about this place draws them in. And there are some very famous ones who reside here. Allegedly, our good friend Marie Laveau is seen here more often than anywhere else, though some claim that she still lives after creating an immortality potion, and she comes here, where her tomb also resides, to communicate with the dead, only to be mistaken for a spirit. It's said that if you place three X's on her tomb, your wish will be granted, and if it is, you must return and place a gift, or you will face the consequences. Some people People report falling ill here, sudden bruises or cuts appearing, and hearing voices. Other spirits of the cemetery include that of a sailor whose family tomb was sold out from under him while on the high seas, and he's looking for somewhere to rest his soul. And finally, we reach number one, the house of Madame Delphine Lalaurie. Delphine was a wealthy woman of high stature who married into even more riches and a grand house. She was also played by Kathy Bates in season three of American Horror Story. Her and her husband were often heard screaming and arguing all the way from the Street, and he eventually left her after finding out some of her dark secrets. Lanary was a monstrous woman who performed terrible experiments on slaves that worked in her house, and her world came crashing down when a fire started in her home. When men arrived to put the fire out, they found many horrors in the attic. They found seven slaves who were suspended by the neck and stretched and bent into horrible positions which they were bound into. Some had pieces of skin flayed off or missing limbs, and one woman had apparently had her bones broken broken such that she could be fit into a box. Delphine fled the city that night and never returned, but it's said that the ghosts of those who were mutilated there haunt the house looking for their revenge. A man who lived there in the 1900s heard the voices telling him to do horrible things, and eventually he took his own life, proving that the spirits want no one to enter the house where such atrocities happened. Number 10, the Bisman Building. The Bisman Building was built in 1886, and fun fact, the film Shawshank Redemption used this place as a filming location. If you have seen the film, the building is used as the entrance to the Brewer Hotel, where Brooks and Red stayed after they were paroled from Shawshank. The real building, though, is haunted. While here, many people experience a feeling of dread and sadness, particularly on the third floor. Many people also report an overwhelming sensation of darkness when on this floor, so if I were you, I would just stay away from the third floor in general. Disembodied footsteps, voices being poked and pushed, black shadows and dark figures caught in images seems to be something that happens a lot. Spirits of a young girl Ruthie, her aunt, and the spirit of a retired worker who died in an accident before leaving the building are three identified spirits that stay here. In past investigations here, investigators have received audible responses to their questions. Yep, the ghosts spoke to them. One piece of audio evidence was when an investigator asked if they could speak to Ruthie, and a voice was caught saying, is Ruthie here. In addition to Ruthie, people have witnessed the spirit of a woman throughout the upper floors, people in Victorian clothing, and the sounds of people working. Number 9. Staley Road Sometime in the early 1800s, pioneer John Wrench used the services of three Staley brothers to build a flour mill. The finished structure was to become the first double-wheeled mill in Ohio. The business flourished, and after several years, John had made enough money to retire and ended up selling his mill to Elias Daly. The mill was then passed down to his brother Andrew and continued to produce flour until 1905. Today, the mill is still standing and on Staley Road, named for the brothers, winds its way past and through the woods. It has become something of a rite of passage for local teens to drive this road at night to show how brave they are. It's been said that old man Staley went on a rampage ending the lives of many and is now haunting the road. Motorists say that they often experience unexplained car trouble, and some have even seen Staley's ghost standing next to or even lying in the road. 
Number 8. The Golden Lamb As the oldest hotel in Ohio, the Golden Lamb has seen more than its share of famous guests, including Charles Dickens, Mark Twain, Daniel Webster, and 12 American presidents. Yeah. 12. It's fantastic, but there's also been death and tragedy in the hotel. Guests have cited a girl who may be Sarah Stubbs, the niece of the hotel manager in the 1800s, or possibly Eliza Clay, a girl who died of a high fever at the hotel in 1825. The ghost of Charles R. Sherman, an Ohio Supreme Court justice who died at the inn in 1929, is said to appear in the hallways as a gray, gaunt man and conjures the smell of cigar smoke. Charles's death left his wife and 11 children, including Civil War General William T. Sherman, penniless. As a result, most of his children were put up for adoption, and some say the guilt of his family's demise keeps his spirit at the inn. Number 7. Crybaby Bridge Locals say if you stand on the Alliance Area Bridge at night, the sound of crying can be heard. Some say that mothers who did not want their sons or daughters during the baby boom would talk them from the bridge into the river below in the dark of the night. Others believe the cries stem from members of a cult kidnapping locals and ending their lives as part of their secret ritual. And finally, some say ghostly cries stem from a distraught mother who lost it after her daughter would not stop crying. In desperation, she tossed her over the bridge to her death, and upon realizing what she had done, the woman reportedly drove off the bridge her own life. This is all around sad and creepy, but if I heard crying noises without anyone around and on a bridge nonetheless, I would be terrified. Number 6. Old Chestnut Grove Cemetery The story goes a woman accused of witchcraft was executed and buried at the cemetery. The townsfolk did not erect a marker, but instead built an iron fence around her grave, which was next to an old tree. An indentation next to the tree inside the fence marks her grave, and it's said that bad things will happen to those who get close to her grave. Another variation of the story says that several witches were executed and buried here, and their ghosts continue to haunt this area, which does not shock me. Not only did this happen, but on December 29th, 1876, the number 5 Pacific Express was traveling over a high bridge, carrying approximately 159 passengers and crew when the bridge collapsed. It sent the train and the people on it into the ravine below, and 92 people died. Many were burned alive while trapped inside the crushed cars and are buried in a mass grave at the cemetery. Due to this, people have seen ghosts of the passengers and unexplained voices on tape have been recorded. Number 5. Malsalon Public Library Let me just say, there's more than books in this building. Before it was a library, it was a house, and former residents Clara Baldwin Barrick and Annie Baldwin both died in the home. Clara lived in the home from 1895 to 1909, and her daughter-in-law Annie died in the home in 1930. This might explain why this place is haunted. Some visitors have heard footsteps or smelt an unfamiliar perfume. Employees get a chill with no explanation in the outreach room located in the basement of the former home. A patron once claimed to have been pushed by an apparition while in the library, and a security camera in the library caught the elevator traveling to the third floor at 3 a.m. The doors opened and a bright light could be seen, and the phenomena has been caught on tape several times and there is no explanation explanation, and that is just like an immediate no. No. Director Sherry Brown, who has worked at the library since 1979, said she was working in her office, a former bedroom of the home, after the library closed when she thought she saw an employee walk past her office door. She yelled out but got no answer. When she investigated, she found no one. Paranormal investigators have conducted research in the library and have gotten responses from the ghosts during electronic voice phenomenon sessions. And if you thought libraries were boring, let me just say this one definitely definitely isn't. Number 4. Lock 4 Park An incident occurred here in 1857 which has resulted in the park being haunted. A canal worker, whom some say was the lock tender, may have been angry about the potential of work being shut down and wanted revenge. The angry worker doused his fellow workers with a container of acid or some type of caustic liquid. It said the enraged worker tossed the lid open and flung the continents on his fellow workers, dumping the rudiments on himself. Legend states that no immediate deaths ensued 
ensued, but rather the men suffered gruesome, slower deaths that took several days. A few men perished due to their acid eaten skin and organs. The man responsible also died. Today, screams and moans of those who were burned by the acid supposedly can still be heard by some if they listen closely while visiting Lock 4 Park. Also, the Lock Tender's cabin, which is located in the park, may also be haunted by the spirit of the angry worker. Number 3. Franklin Castle Franklin Castle is reported to be the most haunted house in Ohio. Rumors about the eerie castle began to surface after multiple deaths occurred in the Tideman family while living in the mansion. The home was built in 1883 by Haynes Tideman, a banker and co-founder of the Union Banking and Savings Company. And let me just add that the house has four stories and more than 20 rooms and 80 windows. Now Haynes allegedly tore down another house on the property where four of his children had died. His first wife Lucia died inside Franklin Castle in the 1890s. The American businessman would eventually bury three more of his children and his mother. Since then, the location has been the site of mysterious hauntings. A family with six children called the Romanos had moved into the house and on the day they moved in, two of their children said they encountered a crying girl in white on the third floor. But when Miss Romano investigated, no one was there. Soon the family started hearing haunting organ music and heavy footsteps. Two of the older Romano children woke up one night to find something yanking the blankets off their bed. And Miss Romano once awoke to find herself screaming on her bedroom floor with an unseen presence screaming beside her. A priest advised the Romanos to move out and in 1974, they did. But the hauntings didn't stop when the Romanos left. From there, the house was sold again and again and again. Each new occupant reported strange occurrences like passing through odd vapors, hearing a child crying, or seeing a woman in black standing in the window. Since reports of hauntings at Franklin's castle increased, many turned their suspicions onto its original owner. Number 2. Sister Century House Restaurant Now a restaurant, this building has seen a lot in the past. It was built in 1870 and has been home to several businesses in historic Canal Fulton throughout the years. It currently houses a family owned restaurant but was most notably home to a crematorium which was located in the basement back in the early 1900s. I mean, since this place was once filled with dead people, it's no shock that it's haunted. There have been rumors of shadow people, a poltergeist in the kitchen, ghostly ladies in the basement, the entrance to an old tunnel, and even an unusual room that makes people a bit dizzy. The food though seems to be great as the restaurant has a 4.6 star rating, so if you want to see some ghosts and have a great meal, I suggest you check this place out. And coming in at number 1, the Ohio State Reformatory. The Ohio State Reformatory opened its doors on September 15, 1896 to its first 150 offenders. These prisoners were brought by train from Columbus and put immediately to work on the prison sewer system in the 25 foot stone wall surrounding the complex. The reformatory remained in full operation until December 1990 when it was closed via federal court order as a result of a prisoner's class action suit citing overcrowding and inhumane conditions. For example, in the late 1930s, a riot broke out in the East Cell Block. The guards condemned 120 rioters to share 12 solitary confinement cells for one week without food or water. This punishment drove many to the brink of madness and death. During its 94 years as a working prison, 154,000 inmates passed through the gates of the Ohio State Reformatory. Many died of diseases like influenza and tuberculosis, some went mad, others ended their lives, and at least one inmate lit himself on fire. Just outside the reformatory, there are 215 numbered graves. While visiting, people have reported being pushed and punched by unseen forces, many claim to feel a chill while on the prison grounds. People have also heard cell doors slam shut and seen dark apparitions. Even the road leading to the Ohio State Reformatory seems to be haunted. Local legend suggests it's the ghost of Phoebe Wise, a notorious hermit and eccentric. Kicking off the list at number 10, Bermesia, aka the Vanishing Island. Is this where Wonder Woman lives? This is crazy. Bermesia sounds a lot like Bermuda, but they're very, very different. I'd say Bermesia is darker, almost, dare I say. Bermesia Island was seen on several maps. Cartographers clocked it numerous times, as you would on island. I'm talking back in the 16th century, but in 1997 it wasn't seen during a survey, and again in 2009 when researchers went to go find this location, 
it was gone. It had vanished, it disappeared. It was originally charted off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula, and it was an 80 square kilometer island, so not small. But the leading theory to its absence was that this cartographer maybe put a fake island on the map to spot copycats. That's one way to watermark your work, also one way to get people lost as shit. But do we believe it? Some cartographers say the island has been sunk since 1844, and others say it's still there. Number nine, the Forbidden City. The Forbidden City, there's a name, let's talk about this one. Built all the way back in 1420, around the time of the Ming Dynasty, the Forbidden City is said to be extremely haunted. Aside from being the largest ancient palatial structure on the planet, we also got ghosts. Love it. Located in Beijing, China, it's one of the five most important palaces in the world. It was the Imperial Palace of China from 1420 to 1912, and more than 24 emperors lived here. This massive city took 1 million workers 14 years to build. Inside the city, there's around 980 buildings, 8,000 rooms, roughly, so a lot of rooms to haunt. It's ghost paradise in there, I guess. It was declared a World Heritage Site in 1987, but come 2000, a Starbucks was built on the land. I'm not kidding. The classic, that's why I had to throw this in. There's a Starbucks books here. You can get a venti latte and also be haunted. This is wild. By the time 2007 came along, there was enough outrage to get officials to close that Starbucks. So sorry to tell you, no more venti lattes, Sarah. You have to go somewhere else. Number eight, Mount Osor. Mount Osor is not the name of just one single mountain, but an entire mountainous range. So ha, threw like a four in one for this one. I guess, I don't know how mountains work. Translating to Mount Fear, great nickname, this area is known as the entrance to the afterlife because it features all the geographical elements that are similar to the Japanese Buddhist descriptions of paradise and hell. I'm like, we have one mountain in Vancouver, I don't know. Not only is the area home to eight symbolic mountaintops, but also a lake with acid water that one species of fish can survive in. Nothing but bare pits full of vipers and acid water. Is this like Zelda? I feel like this is Ocarina of Time. Not an ideal spot to take the family camping. That's all I'm saying. Beyond this mountain range, it gets interesting. There's a river that's known as the border between Earth and Hell. So, if you have your swimsuits on, you know, go and take a little dip. This is where each and every soul must cross in order to reach the afterlife, so actually avoid it. I lied. If I'm somehow selling you on this idea and you want to go take a trip to Viper Lane, when you get there, you'd find statues and offerings along the banks of the river, which are intended to help the past souls find their way during this journey, because it's definitely not good if the souls were to get lost. As I said, also a gateway to hell. Every year from July 22nd to July 24th, those wanting to communicate with the dead will head here. They'll head to the temple to speak with the spiritual mediums known as the Itako. So if you're feeling like spicing up your weekend, maybe, you know, go say hi to Gam Gam. Here you go. Just bring your water shoes. Sounds like a trek. Number seven, Moonville Tunnel. Located deep in the woods, the tunnel is framed by a faded stone arcway covered in moss. The tunnel itself is long and extremely dark. It's actually an out of work stretch of railroad track that leads to an old cold mining town. If you're brave enough to venture through it, you might see the ghost of Frank Lawhead, an unlucky train conductor who met his end in a head on collision with another train. Visitors in the area have taken photos with cameras or phones, only to look back at them later and notice the pale figure of a man they didn't see before, or phantom train lights blazing at the end of the tunnel. It's also said if you listen carefully, inhale deeply, and blink intermittently, you may encounter spirits from another time. The piercing whistle of a train rounding a curve, the smell of lavender wafting from a woman in an old fashioned dress, or even the glow of gaslit lantern illuminating the face of the weathered brake man. So that's fun. Number six, the Buxton Inn. The Buxton Inn was built by Orrin Granger in 1812 as an inn in Tavern, and it also served as Granville's first post office and as a stagecoach stop. I'm just gonna say it, this place is haunted. The first ghost spotted in the Buxton Inn was the first owner, Orrin. Other ghosts include the lady in blue, rumored to be the former innkeeper, Ethel Bonnie Bonnell, Major Buxton, whom the inn was named, and even a phantom cat seen slinking along the halls. There's been strange activity like footsteps and doors opening on their own reported in the inn's basement, where stagecoach drivers would often stay during their stopovers in the past. However, the ghosts just don't stay in the basement, oh no. Rooms 7 and 9 are said to be the strongest places for activity, with apparitions appearing. One guest even reported a ghost cat showing up to cuddle and purr in the middle of the night, which, like, 
Oh, that's so cute. <laughs> Guests have reported strange phenomenon throughout the hotel though, like their names being called out and invisible footsteps. I would not want to sleep there. Number 5. Woods surrounding London Okay, again, not London, England, but London, Ohio. Deep inside these woods sits an old abandoned barn that is so rotted away it has practically melded back into the trees. It's rumored that ghosts like to spend some time here. If you ask anyone from the area, they'll tell you that these woods are haunted. According to legend, a family of five was traveling through the woods in the late 1890s when they were stopped and had their lives ended by a band of thieves. Those brave enough to wander through the woods of London at night have reported hearing gunshots and disembodied screaming. Others have felt a sudden drop in temperature before seeing a strange white mist hanging in the trees. Let me just say, it's a no for me. Number 4. Ridges Asylum Ridges Asylum originally opened in 1874 and was known as the Athens Asylum for the Insane. It had two wings, one for female patients and one for the male patients. The most violent patients were housed at the outermost tip of each wing. By the start of the 1900s, the asylum had become dangerously overcrowded and rumors of inhumane treatment at the hands of the overworked staff were growing. Despite this, it was not officially closed until 1990. Some parts of the building are still in use, while other areas are completely abandoned. One of the scariest places in the building is the outline of a body where Margaret Schrilling died in 1979. She apparently got lost in the disused part of the hospital in the winter of 1978-79 and was not found for more than a month. When the corpse was eventually removed, it left a stain that could never be washed away, which just makes me gag thinking about it, but imagine the smell like Ew. Ugh. She is one of the many ghosts who is said to walk the asylum at night. Strange figures have been seen roaming around the old floors. Others have heard disembodied voices, footsteps, and screaming. Most appealing to imagination is the basement. Some claim severely disabled patients were kept on chains in dungeon like places. Some say they've even heard the chains being pulled. Oh, and there's also a cemetery on the grounds which holds over 1,930 bodies. Of those, 700 women and 959 men lay under the headstones marked with only a number, which is sad. Number 3. Bobby Mackey's Built in 1850, Bobby Mackey's is said to be the most haunted nightclub in America. When it was first built, the building served as a slaughterhouse and meat packing facility. The standard for most slaughterhouses of its day, the facility featured a well to collect the runoff of animal blood, innards, and other waste. If that image wasn't icky enough, there have also been several deaths in and around the club throughout the years. The place harbors energy so dark that a portal to hell is rumored to swirl somewhere within its basement. There is strange suffocating heat, a trash can once flew through the air, and the apparition of a man with a handlebar mustache appears in the mirror. I would not want to get anywhere near that place. Ever. Number 2. Licking County Jail Originally opened in 1889, the Licking County Jail is now home to only prisoners serving after life sentences. It contains stacks of cramped, grimy cells lining its dimly lit halls. Since being put out of commission, the jail has become a notoriously haunted hotspot. While it was operating, a total of three sheriffs and 19 inmates died on the premise. If you make your way to Licking County Jail, it's said you should peer between the cell bars as figures of prisoners are said to peer back. Visitors have reported hearing cell doors slamming, being touched, whispering in your ear, whistles, the sound of footsteps, some of those being what seems residual, the jingling of keys, screams and moaning, as well as seeing strange light anomalies, full shadow figures, and photos with unexpected images in them. That sounds absolutely terrifying and I, I would not want to go there. And coming in at number one is Sedamesville Rectory. The Sedamesville Rectory is a historical building that once served as the home for priests of Our Lady of Perpetual Help Church. Priests of questionable moral character were rumored to live here, if you know what I mean, including a man who was moved around considerably before retiring from the priesthood, leaving some to believe the church was covering up his tendency of mistreating animals. His fellow priests later confessed to hearing strange 
sounds coming from his bedroom and feeling uneasy in his presence. As the alleged site of the mistreatment, it's no shock that the place has some wicked demonic energy. Reports detail strange howling cries and deep scratches appearing in the flesh of workers. The current owner of the building, Terry Scott, even claimed that she was pushed by an invisible force. The presence was so evil that a priest was called in to perform an exorcism, but his efforts did little to keep the demonic energy at bay, and whatever monster lurked in there still remains, and I would not want to mess with it. Starting off this countdown, we have the sarcophagus. Basically, this is a massive steel and concrete structure that covers the Chernobyl power plant. It was designed to help contain the radiation. The construction of the structure lasted for 206 days, and those working on it had to work in shifts of no more than 7 minutes. Any more time spent near the reactors would have killed them. But still, they did sacrifice their lives building this because thousands of workers still died from exposure to the radiation. Those that survived got severely ill, and majority of them developed cancer. Nowadays, the sarcophagus is still there, but it's beginning to crumble. In 2019, they were in the process of dismantling it because it was going to collapse. So a new one is currently being installed. That's probably the scariest thing in Chernobyl because of how deadly the building it's containing is. Coming in at number 9 we have the gas masks, and if you guys are liking this video or want to see part 3 then smash that like button. Chernobyl already looks like the place where an apocalypse occurred. Buildings are completely abandoned, run down, and overgrown with nature. What doesn't help is the piles upon piles of gas masks scattered all throughout Chernobyl. This really adds to the eeriness of this place, and again, makes it look like a place where a zombie or alien takeover occurred. In fact, there is one one room inside a school which is just completely filled with child sized gas masks. It's very creepy, but also sad. Like imagine how frightened the young children were when this happened. The gas masks found there are just a sad reminder of the horrors that took place there when the reactor exploded. Moving on to number 8 we have the rotting toys. Littered all throughout the city are toys or personal belongings people had to leave behind. The saddest thing to see are pictures of children's toys left behind. Like I just think that was probably someone's favorite little dolly. Go anywhere there and you'll find items scattered everywhere, now broken and covered in filth. Like imagine, you're rushed out of your home and have to leave behind all your personal belongings. That must have been so hard, I can't imagine how everyone must have felt. It's really depressing to think about. Number 7. Ghost City Bengu is located in China and it's also referred to as the City of Ghosts. Again, more ghosts, we love it. For a long time it was believed that this is where the dead would stop on their way to the afterlife. In order to get there, they have to pass three tests. Let's talk about them. The first test is for the newly departed soul who must cross over the bridge of helplessness, which is a little bit different than the bridge to Terabithia, although equally as sad, equally surprisingly as sad. This is meant to judge their virtue. There are demons here who judge whether the soul is good or bad, and the good ones can pass while the bad ones are pushed into the water below. Imagine a demon pushing you into the water. I'd, I'd die again, dare I say. The ones who pass the first the first test go on to the ghost touring pass, where they stand in front of the ruler of the underworld. If they pass the judgment test, then the third and final trial takes place at the Tianzi Palace, where they will stand on a certain stone on one leg for three minutes. This is where all that hot yoga comes in handy. Only a small amount of souls can do this, apparently. If you lose your balance, maybe you're not wearing your minimal runners, well, you'd be condemned to hell. Right now, I'd be good. I got the I got the one up. Fengdu also now has many temples and shrines which holds paintings and sculptures that show people in the underworld. So if you want to go visit and check it out, I'd recommend it. Just, again, get that balance down. Number six, North Sentinel Island. All right, getting more to the island, the tropicalness of this list. Heading over to India, this island, you've probably heard of it. It's home of the Sentinelese tribe, one of the most forbidden islands in the world, but do you really know why? Located in the Bay of Bengal, North Sentinel Island is about 1,200 kilometers away from India. And while most islands are shrinking or seemingly vanishing, this one actually grew back in 2004. The island lifted up a couple of meters during an earthquake, so the west and south sides gained an extra kilometer. That's massive. Imagine seeing this happen. It'd be slow, but you definitely notice. The inhabitants on this floating cursed islands are among the few uncontacted tribes left in the world. 
period. They've apparently been there for 50,000 years. There's no sign of agriculture or fire or smoke or anything yet. We know this tribe has continued to thrive. If we try and get close, they try and drive anybody away and they use all means possible. It's pretty scary. Number five, underwater Mayan cave. Back in 2018, a diver was exploring flooded caves in Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. They were at the beach. They saw this opening about a foot and a half wide, barely big enough for one person. And they thought, oh, I'll go through it because you know, they're insane. I could never do this. I can't even swim like under the pool ladder, let alone do any of this. I can't, my heart races reading this. This diver went through, which is terrifying and impressive. Once they were in, they found this underwater tunnel connected to the Sac Atun cave and the Dos Ojos cave systems. That's a pretty wonderful discovery, not gonna lie. It's considered one of the longest underwater systems in the world, running about 347 kilometers long. So that's a long way to go, so hold your breath. This cave has been untouched since the last ice age and the 200 spots were filled with bones, mine altars, fossils belonging to, of course, now extinct animals. It's a literal time capsule from thousands of years ago. If you're diving through these small cave entrances, don't go alone, honestly, you might get stuck. Or apparently you might find bones or the possible entrance to the underworlds. Just take your goggles, you never know what you're gonna expect. All things I don't want to experience, let alone experience underwater. Ugh, hard pass, if you're a splunker, Hats off to you. Can't even spell splunking. Number four, Island Moor, Scotland. I've only been to Scotland twice, but this story makes me want to keep it at a nice number two. That's it. Not going again. Never. Do you guys have haunted islands? What's going on over there, huh? What better island to visit than one with nobody on it, right? Doesn't that just sound like paradise? In 1900, a ship was heading to the Flannan Islands, and it was completely uninhabited at the time. And on the ship, we had Captain James Harvey and Joseph Moore. Just two dudes. They were heading there to watch the lighthouse, but upon arrival, nobody greeted them. He blew his horn, waited, still nobody was there. There was supposed to be a replacement lighthouse keeper that would, you know, come to shore and then they would swap out roles, but nothing was happening. So they started walking up the steep set of stairs towards the lighthouse, looking around, nobody was there. When he got there, he realized the door was unlocked and two of the three coats were missing. And upon further investigation, he saw half eaten food, a chair that had been tossed over and a kitchen clock that had completely stopped. I mean, that's, you know, things stop working sometimes. That's not too bad, but there's no sign of the keepers. That's the craziest part. When checking the lighthouse log, the previous days didn't sound too good. It wasn't great. It wasn't like, Hey, had a couple days of rain, but the rest was gorgeous. Have fun. Cheers. No, it wasn't like that at all. It was creepy. The December 12th log read severe winds, the likes of which I've never seen before in 20 years. James was awfully quiet and William, the third lad was crying the whole time. That's a pretty sinister log. I don't know. It's like, yeah, the winds are pretty crazy. James is crying and he's on the ceiling. I'm just going to write this down. No one look at me. Number three, Three, Vancouver Island, BC. This one, it's close to home, oh boy. Vancouver Island is home to dozens of disappearances and no one really knows why. In late July, 1993, young Lindsay Nichols was walking along Royston Road in the Comics Valley and then she was never seen again. Again in 2018, on the 25th anniversary of her disappearance, her mother Judy said in an interview with Victoria News that there were around 400 tips, numerous excavated sites and 15 polygraph exams completed by the RCMP, but still there was nothing. There's also been a huge spike in missing men over the last 20 years. They're all similar in age and looks. So the online community thinks that there's something else going on that's a bit more dark and sinister. You know what I mean? What do you guys think is going on here? I had to throw in a real, like kind of real life dark one instead of like spooky underground tunnels, just to, you know, just to mix it up. We're getting a little serious now. Number two, the Paris catacombs. What feels like a never ending maze, these tunnels under Paris stretch for hundreds of miles. I've seen a movie on this one time. It's so scary. I'm never checking this place out. Scotland, Paris, I'm not going anywhere. I'm just staying here forever. There've been movies on these catacombs. As above, so below. That's what it's called. There we go. Knew I could think of it. Originally, these tunnels were built for Paris stone mines, but near the end of the 18th century, its purpose started to shift, rather. I don't know. It's gross. Cemeteries were starting to pile up. Literally, they weren't as good as getting rid of bodies in clean ways as we are now. So they just handled bodies like we handle garbage, just out of sight, out of mind. We'll just toss them in one place and just pretend it doesn't exist. So bodies would be laying on the side of the road. They start to pile up. So the solution here was to use these catacombs. These tunnels have been there for centuries. So you might as well put them to good use. By good use, I mean, let's just stack skulls in an orderly fashion and terrify people for hundreds of years to come. Awesome. Number one, the dragon's triangle. Oh, you thought there was only one spooky triangle in town? Think again, my friend. The Dragon's Triangle is located in the Pacific. It's like the evil sister of the Bermuda Triangle. And just like the Bermuda one, this triangle also takes blame for disappearing ships and planes. Now we got numerous triangles to worry about. This is some Illuminati Mother Earth stuff going on here. One of the most intriguing parts of this triangle is that this monument is sitting at the bottom of the ocean right in the middle of it. It's called the Unigani Monument. You've probably heard of it before on this channel. This structure was discovered back in the 80s near, of course, Unigani Island in Japan. And the claim is that this was once an ancient city. 
It's 160 feet long, this monument, and it's 65 feet wide, so pretty small city, so that's why we're kind of torn over this one. Some think this object is man-made, with the lines being so straight. It looks like these paths were carved almost. There's like literal tiny stairs. I can totally see how this resembles something like the pyramids of Egypt. But the fact that it's so deep underwater makes us think that it was a natural formation. Maybe. Either way, it's a triangle. It's spooky. Things disappear, and there's something in the water. That's enough for me. That's it. Starting us off at number 10 is Maple Hill Cemetery. Founded in 1822, this cemetery is the oldest and largest burial ground in the state, where roughly 80,000 people have been laid to rest. But with that many souls in one place, it only takes a matter of time before people start noticing something strange happening. While during the day, you may be spared from witnessing a horrifying spirit, it's said at night the tortured souls are unearthed, roaming the ground in search of answers. Most unsettling is the park on the property, also known as the Dead Playground. Oh gee, that sounds inviting, don't you think? Apparently it's nicknamed that as many young people are buried in the area. And visitors brave enough to see for themselves what goes on claim that at night the trapped souls of the young can be seen playing around the park while their creepy giggles echo throughout the grounds. But whatever you do, make sure you pay respect to Mary Bibb. If you knock on her mausoleum walls, she will reply with a gentle creak of her rocking chair buried inside. But if you forget to greet her, well, she just might haunt you forever. Coming in at number 9 is Fort Morgan. Said to be one of the most haunted places in all of Alabama, Fort Morgan is rife with ghoulish tales of ghosts and strange occurrences. The most notorious is that of a prisoner who's said to have died here in the early 1900s after he took his own life in the barracks. People say that if you walk past, you can still hear him crying out late at night. But he's not the only one you should fear. There's also a female spirit that wanders the grounds in search of justice after she too lost her life after being dragged into the fort and beaten to death by mysterious attackers who were never caught for the crime. Many believe she is an angry spirit with a vengeance who will torture any man who steps foot on the property. So if I were you, I'd skip this one. Next up at number 8 is Drish House. Once the home of Dr. John R. Marsh, a gambler and a drunk who built the estate in 1835 for his beloved bride Sarah. The couple lived in the home for 32 years until one day John had too much to drink for the last time and drunkenly tumbled over the stairway falling to his demise. But you might be surprised that it's not his spirit that's trapped here, actually his wife Sarah. While no one knows for sure what keeps her her soul trapped on the property. Some say she was so traumatized after finding her husband dead in their home and wasn't able to recover. Others believe, however, that she refuses to leave because her family failed to honor her own funeral wishes, and so she remains causing trouble to anyone who steps foot on the property to this day. While today the manor is used for many celebrations, Sarah remains tormenting guests of the events, trying to get them to leave. If you're brave enough to visit, try looking up at the third story tower. It says you can catch a glimpse of her up there. Just be careful she doesn't see you looking or she may just follow you around the property terrorizing you until you leave. Moving on at number 7 we have the examination chair. So uh, this one is pretty strange, but somehow a gynecologist examination chair ended up in the middle of the woods outside of a hospital. Not only is that super weird, but it's also super creepy. It's all rusted and beat up and looks like an old torture device. Not only that, but that means someone had to go inside the abandoned hospital, find that chair, and then carry it all the way back down and into the woods. I got a lot of questions. Why would someone do this? And how long did it take them to do this? And again, why would someone do this? Either way, it makes for a very spooky encounter. Moving on at number 6 we have the abandoned cooling tower. A partially constructed cooling tower can be found at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. They were built to evaporate the cooling water from the two new reactors. Sadly, they were never completed. Now, these things are massive. The diameter was over 120 meters, and it stands at 150 meters tall. Obviously, after the accident, there was no need to continue on with the construction of this, so the government just left the towers there along with everything else. 
Eventually, over time, nature will have its way with it and it will start to erode and crumble. It's just crazy seeing all these abandoned infrastructures. Imagine how life would have been if that explosion never happened. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with the Toxic River. There's a river that's just filled with radioactive water right near the reactor. The scariest part is despite how toxic the water is, a bunch of aquatic life live there. In particular, giant catfish. Yes, giant catfish. A video from 2016 shows a massive catfish swimming in the water. People originally were like, oh my god, what the heck is that? It must be some sort of mutated animal. Later, it was just found out to be a giant catfish. But still, what the heck? And it's the fact that they have adapted to be able to survive in that highly toxic water. Like, that just baffles me. Not only that, but they can thrive there because the water has no higher predators. Obviously, though, you're not allowed to go fishing there. Okay, I feel like that's a given, but I also feel like people would still try it, so I'm just gonna say it. Don't go fishing there. In our fourth spot, we have the jarfish. Speaking of fish, we're gonna go with this. So back in 2016, photographer and journalist Miriam Wazer took a trip to explore the ruins of Chernobyl. While inside an abandoned building, she came across something very creepy and odd. She found a bunch of fish and other specimen in jars. Why someone was collecting fish, it just baffles many. And they weren't even like proper beakers or science mason jars. No, no, it looked like someone emptied out their jar of pickles and then used it to store the specimen. I think it's best if those remain untouched. Like, can you imagine how stinky they would be if they were open nowadays? They would reek. Old stinky fish is not something I would ever want to handle. Now the other specimen beside the fish are unknown. No one knows what the heck they are. But if you know, let me know in the comments below. Coming in at number three, we have the abandoned hospitals. The hospitals at Chernobyl are quite eerie. They're just filled with rusted, empty hospital beds, littered syringes, and more. The walls and floors are cracking, and there's dirt and questionable red marks on the floor. I think the saddest thing, though, is that these hospitals are often trashed with medical supplies just tossed everywhere. The days after the explosion happened, people were frantically rushing to hospitals. Hospital staff were overwhelmed by the amount of people there. This moment is still preserved in the hospitals to this day. It's pretty dark once you think about it. And at number two today, we have the Sad Alley. The Sad Alley, or the Alley of Memory, is an alley in the Ukraine created in memory of the villages and residents who had to flee from their homes during the disaster. Basically, it's a walkway with signs lining the sides. These signs are names of cities and villages that had to evacuate and leave everything behind. It's a way to ensure we just never forget the impact that this disaster had. It's really sad. And in our number one spot today, we have the radioactive spiders. Yes, you heard me correctly. Imagine if Peter Parker got bit by one of these bad guys. He'd be like a weirdly mutated Spider-Man or something like that. But anyways, the spiders in the exclusion zone are radioactive. So you definitely don't want to be bit by one. Oh wait, it gets worse. They also make radioactive webs. Yeah, you heard me, that's a thing. So you don't have to just worry about these spiders, but you have to worry about walking through their deadly webs. Like, what the heck? No thank you, nah, -uh. I'm not a fan of spiders, but imagine radioactive ones. That sounds like it belongs in a horror movie. Radioactive, radioactive. 